Hello, I'm Sonal Fear and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. Late last year I took a look at the Ryzen 5 2400G processor over at my friend Houndlander's channel. Generally when I am testing hardware I try to match up what I have with the best components for testing, and my last 2400G test was using 2666MHz memory, which was the fastest I had going spare at the time. The thing is, these APUs love faster memory, especially for the onboard graphics, and I've wanted to revisit this one for a little while with faster RAM when I came across it at a reasonable price, or through my normal PC building. I recently came into some of that faster memory, and therefore wanted to revisit the Ryzen 2400G with faster RAM, and here's that revisit in video form today. Let's get started. The Ryzen 5 2400G is a quad-core processor with SMT, with a base speed of 3.6GHz, boosting up to 39 when thermal conditions allow. It was one of the first Ryzen-based APUs on AM4, a combined processor and GPU for those who wanted solid GPU performance without a discrete graphics card. I'm not going to spend too much time on the processor side of things today. This CPU is remarkably similar in performance and specification to the recently reviewed Ryzen 3 4100. So if you're looking at this processor for its CPU performance, my recent 4100 review will give you a very good idea of how the processor itself performs outside of those integrated graphics. The star of today's video is the onboard graphics, the Radeon Vega 11 graphics built into the processor. Featuring 704 shading units, this is the full fat Vega experience in regards to Vega based iGPUs, and in theory performs very similar to a GeForce GT 1030. That's actually fairly impressive for an integrated solution, and should allow us to get some gaming in, providing we use sensible settings. Vega iGPUs in particular are very sensitive to good memory speeds, so we're using some really decent memory here, 32 gigs of Patriot Viper Steel ARGB. Aside from the ARGB that looks a little ridiculous in my test bench, the Viper memory here is the same stuff I actually use in my personal AM4 build, and I quite like it. Even though the Ryzen 2400G officially only supports up to 2933 MHz, I had absolutely no issues getting this memory running at its full 3200 MHz speed, just by setting it in the BIOS, and that has a positive benefit to the Vega iGPU, as it will take advantage of the higher speed to give us better performance today. You can buy the Ryzen 2400G for around £20 today, so what does £20 get for us in gaming? Here's the test setup specifications. As always, a very modest setup where the RAM is probably the most expensive part of the entire build, and we'll be going for playable performance here today rather than absolute performance. I have tweaked graphical settings and capped the frame rate where necessary to answer one question. Can you have a good time on integrated graphics? Let's find out. First up is Fallout 4. At 1080p and using medium settings capped to 30fps, the Vega 11 delivers a decent Xbox One-like experience most of the time. There are occasional drops into the mid-twenties when things were really heated up, especially around Core Vega, but overall Fallout 4 was more than playable, and if it's the only way you could enjoy the game, then there's still a great time to be had. Consider dropping that resolution to 900p if you would prefer a little more consistency, but I personally found this absolutely fine. Dying Light is another good performer at realistic settings. At 900p using the game's medium preset and capped 30fps, the Vega 11 was pretty rock solid here delivering another Xbox One level of performance that was playable throughout the half hour or so of my playtime, with very little deviation. It wasn't perfect of course, some slight dips here and there, but if you've played the Xbox One version, then what you get here is remarkably similar to that performance, and that was more than playable. Grand Theft Auto Legacy is next. At 1080p and targeting normal settings, I also went for 60fps on this one, although we did end up a little short. It didn't particularly look great, but it actually ran quite well considering we don't have a discrete GPU here, and the mid-40s delivery was more than good enough for it to be quite playable. If you want a little more eye candy, you could probably bump up those settings a notch and target 30fps for a nicer looking game, but what you prefer is going to be up to you here. I found this more than playable. Counter-Strike 2 now. At 1080p using the medium settings, I aimed for the 60fps mark again here, although the average was a little under it. It's hard to tell as MSI Afterburner doesn't display in CS2 whenever I have tested it, but the game was at least smooth enough to play. I've been out of the Counter-Strike loop for 20 years, so I'm not sure what settings you'd target here to be competitive, but I found it playable enough without feeling hindered by the fact I was using onboard graphics. I don't normally test CS2, but I know a few of you will want to see it, so I'll defer to your judgement here on if this is actually a good level of performance, although once again I did find it plenty playable enough. Metro Last Light now. At 1080p and using medium settings, I went through a 30fps target here, looking to get a similar kind of experience to the Xbox One version of the game, albeit at 30fps. Needless to say, the Vega 11 had absolutely no issue with Last Light Redux, and it was near flawless as I played through the entirety of the Echoes level. An easy thumbs up on this one. I'll be trying both Red Dead Redemptions next, so we'll start off with the original first. 
At 1080p low, with FSR enabled and targeting 60fps, the Vega 11 was consistent enough but like GTA 5, fell a little short on that 60fps target. While it mostly stuck to the higher 40s similar to GTA, there were more pronounced drops to the low 40 mark when you hit Armadillo and other towns. I think you could cap this to 30fps using something like RTSS, and you'd have a pretty solid time to be honest, and that 30fps cap would be my recommendation here for a good experience. Red Dead 2 is where we start to see the limits of the Vega 11. At 720p low and capped to 30fps, the Vega 11 just about delivered 30fps, even in towns, but as you can see from the footage, it really isn't looking great. Red Dead 2 is, in my opinion, one of the best looking games ever made, and to get it to run on the Vega 11 you really have to start having to aim low, which takes away something from the game I feel. Sure, it runs and say, if your graphics card crapped out on you and you had to use a Vega 11 for an evening, you could manage. But I certainly couldn't play like this for extended periods despite its otherwise okay performance at the settings we were targeting. The Division 2 is next. At 720p and using the game's low preset, I also capped the frame rate to 30 here for a more consistent experience. Quite surprisingly, the Vega 11 had absolutely no issues running in the Division 2, and this is a game I have had mixed results in on older quad cores, so it's good to see the Ryzen 2400G keeping up absolutely fine too. Overall, a very playable experience despite its fairly low 720p resolution. Once again, I aimed for another Xbox One level of performance in Borderlands 2, and already on Vega 11 managed to hit the 60fps target enough that I would consider it good enough. At 1080p and using the high preset, we saw 60fps the majority of the time, with dips into the low 50s not being uncommon when a lot of stuff was happening on screen at the same time. Played Borderlands 2 for around half an hour on the Ryzen 2400G, and honestly, it's absolutely fine. Personal favourite of mine, Frostpunk, makes its appearance in the suite today. Frostpunk is one of those games that relies on stronger GPU performance. I've tested this on a broad array of processors over the last year, and it doesn't really seem to matter what you use on the CPU side with Frostpunk. The Vega 11 delivered a just about okay level of performance at 720p and using the game's low preset capped 30fps, a target it just about reached but this is really pushing the Vega 11 pretty hard. Left 4 Dead 2 on the other hand was real light work for the Vega 11. At 1080p and using max everything, you will often enjoy your frame rate hitting triple digits here so crank up those settings to max and get at them. The Vega 11 has no issues here at all. Payday 2 is another game with no real performance problems to report on the Vega 11. At 1080p and using the game's medium preset capped to 60fps, Payday 2 also hit those figures most of the time, but will drop a little as it gets a lot busier during the heist and there's loads of stuff going on screen. Aside from the occasional low 50s, Payday 2 remained perfectly playable in the several heists I played during testing here, so you'll have a plenty good time. Sniper Elite 4 is our penultimate game today. At 1080p low, using 75% scaling and a 30fps cap, the Vega 11 achieved a pretty consistent performance here, once again broadly similar to the Xbox One version of the game. It was a solid, enjoyable experience, with only the occasional minor drop into the very high 20s. If you're looking to play Xbox One era games, then the Vega 11 can mostly deliver on that, as all of the games tested today have run at a similar kind of performance profile to Microsoft's console. And finally, a challenge for the Vega. Horizon Zero Dawn now is 720p low and capped 30fps. I also used FSR here to try and keep the frame rate up and the Vega 11 was a little bit of a mixed bag. There was an occasional stutter during gameplay here and I feel that it's borderline on if this happens enough to be a problem, but Zero Dawn did mostly get to that 30fps target even if, like Red Dead 2, it didn't look its best. I played for around half an hour and I'm a little torn as to if this is at an acceptable level of performance. The stuttering feels like it was too frequent to me and therefore a little bit of a deal breaker in my personal opinion. And that's a wrap for today. I first bought the Ryzen 2400G last year. I've actually used it in a temporary build for a little while, and on the CPU side the general performance of the processor is fine. It's a little short on L3 cache, but if you're on a very tight budget then its performance is more than good enough for the money. And the same goes for the Vega 11 integrated graphics. You won't be playing games at 4K on this chip, nor would it be reasonable to expect to be able to. What the Vega 11 offers is a decent onboard solution for those who can't afford a discrete graphics card in this current market at a reasonable price. The onus is then on the end user to be sensible with what they want to achieve in their games. If you have an older library of games that you want to play, then the Vega 11 will play those at a similar level to the Xbox One, and I personally think that's quite impressive for onboard graphics on a CPU that didn't cost that much when it came out. It'll even play newer games to a degree. The Ryzen 2400G is not a million miles away in specification to the custom chip inside Valve's Steam Deck, and that manages fine. 
Sure, you'll be playing newer stuff at lower resolution and ideally at capped frame rates, but that's good enough for the Steam Deck, so it'll be good enough if that's what you're happy with. Moving on to my next videos, I've got a couple of interesting reviews coming up. The next one will be the AMD Athlon X4 950, followed by a review of the GeForce GTX 960. I've been Zenofair, and thank you very much for watching the Tech Quest. Until next time, bye bye.